Word in Your Attic, a Zoom with a view. Welcome to another edition of Word in Your Attic. Now, this one has a, 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 it's slightly different from usual, as it's entirely about the lost world of record shops, because surely no shop has been more closely associated with the person who started it started it than the eternally legendary Bruce's Records in Edinburgh, which was founded by an old pal of ours. And he's joined us now, Bruce Finley. Bruce, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. And you're Pat. still in Edinburgh, aren't you? I'm still in Edinburgh, yes. The, the shop, funny enough, uh, started in Falkirk, the very first one. The first one was in Falkirk, wasn't it? That's yeah. right. We'll, um, we'll, we'll get on to that in a second. The, the, it, it must be so lovely to see how many people have been posting those I found it at Bruce's bags recently. I mean, yes. It must be very gratifying. There's no question about it. The, the Edinburgh 79 Rose Street, Edinburgh, which is just parallel to Prince's Street. It's a little street between Prince's Street, if people know Edinburgh, and George Street. And we were something, a tiny little shop, 400 square feet. And it did become legendary. You're right. It was um, quite amazing. But take us back to when it all started. What, firstly, what were your first memories of what record shops were like? Your, your earliest great, memories. Great memories, Mark. I mean, my mum, my mum was divorced. So there was me and my two brothers, the eldest of which left home very early on when I was about seven or eight. He was 10 years older than me. So 1952, my mum was doing some bookkeeping for this radio shop in Falkirk, although we lived in Edinburgh. And she traveled back and forward. And she said to her boss, Angus McDougall, look, there's an old gramophone record shop just gone bust and they're gonna sell all their stock off. So th this is the days of 78. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, why don't we buy them out? I think records are gonna become a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, he and so they bought the whole stock, you know, about a few thousand records. Yeah. And opened a standalone record shop in Falkirk, Kers Lane, Angus yeah. McDougall's record shop, with my mum behind the counter doing the buying and selling. What year was this then? Can you remember 52, roughly? 52, 53. 52, 53. Wow. I was like eight, and so eight, records eight. at that point were just being sold, what, in department stores or? Yeah, it's record. There were one or two standalone record yeah. shops. And they were quite eccentric. They're a wee bit yeah. like how record shops became that you and I love. Yeah. Right. And alone record shops. There were one or Colettes and things. I think there were one or two in London, but they were specialists. They would specialise in in jazz or, uh, or, uh, or uh, maybe not folk. Yeah, maybe folk. Classical maybe. and things like that, I suppose. I think HMV in Oxford Street had maybe opened at that point. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it had. It had. Yeah. But what happened was HMV did what they called a franchise. So radio shops and department stores would get the franchise to sell HMV records. So you would get, we are an HMV yeah, yeah, yeah. specialist or something yeah. in department stores. So yes, department stores had record shops. And um, so that was, that was my first round. So I used to go through on Saturdays to help out on a Saturday, even as a little boy help out so it would be things like Frankie Lane and Johnny Ray really like that and uh, brilliant. Alma Cogan started by 19 by the mid 50s my mum had made brilliant contacts with the record business and the shop had become a phenomena and she got friendly strangely enough with Winifred Atwell she she was yes! wow. so in 1955 my mum said look as a treat I was just about to start secondary school big boy uh, we're going to fly you to London. Um, and we flew down in one of those little Dakota planes. Uh, the British Airways, of course. But um, to the London Palladium, we we're special guests of Winifred Apple, who was the, people have got to understand, in the mid-50s, early to mid-50s, she was the biggest selling artist. Oh, in God. The Bumble stuff. Boogie by Winifred Apple. Massive yeah. hit. Yeah, Black yeah. and white rag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... But her, her supporting act was the biggest pop star of the time, Alma Cogan. Yeah. And uh, so I got backstage at uh, uh, the London Palladium with a wee boy. You can imagine the excitement, the thrill, and meeting Winifred Atwell and uh, Alma Cogan. So that was my kind of introduction to music. And at that point, I started secondary school. And you'd ask any question about record shops. So my mum's travelling back and forward all the time to Falkirk. I go to school in Edinburgh, the Royal High School, the far end of Princey Street on Colton Hill. 
<coughs> and at lunchtime, he used to nick down to the top of Leith Walk, and there was a shop there called Band Parts. And Band Parts was a fabulous little record shop, and they were very, very clever. They had two little single strips in the, their little window of wood, and they stuck on it about um, five 45s, just right. covers, uh, uh, on each side. So there were like 10 in the window. Yeah. And they typed a label out each week with the new release. So Everly Brothers, Wake Up Little Susie, you know, Elvis Presley, Return to Sender, whatever, you know. That, it was brilliant. And they were really up to date. So we used to get down there and, uh, and look at this, me and my pals from school, uh, and got really excited. Then I would be on the phone to my, well, not on the phone, my mum came back at night and I'd say, have you got the new Gene Vincent record? Have you got yeah. the new uh, Everly Brothers uh, trickets or whatever, you know? And she would, of course. And, say, oh, and she could bring them home. Yeah. She would bring them home and let me play them as long as I was very careful with the record player and she'd take them back again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that was my introduction. So my two big inspirations... My biggest inspiration is my mum, of course, and her record shop, and she was dynamic. And the first record shop stand separate from my mother's was this shop, Band Parts in Edinburgh. Yeah, so that was the beginning, that's the 50s. And so in 1959, I left school and we moved to Falkirk. The shop was doing so well, they expanded, uh, built, moved into a brand new, built a, a new build shop in Falkirk and built a flat above it where my mum and my brother and myself moved into. So we moved to Falkirk in 1950. Sorry, can I interrupt? That's a fantasy of a teenage boy. You yeah, move a into shop. a flat above a record shop that and your you, mum runs. It, is. <laughs> yeah. it was absolutely brilliant because the shop, on the one side, there were two, two streets that kind of came together in a point. Uh, Bank Street, where the record shop was, and Manor Street, where McDougall had his radio and now television and hi-fi department, which my brother managed by this time. My brother was a TV mechanic and became a hi-fi specialist. So he was building hi-fis. And uh, my mother ran the record de department. We had the flat above, as I say. And on the corner was a cafe, <laughs> a cafe with a jukebox, oh. you know. I mean, it was just... It's a dream. A dream. Yeah. Was, I was... Having just moved to Falkirk, did I make friends? Of course I did. I Very bet you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I my bet mom you. My mum was known as Miss Shearer, and she was a bit of a demon. And because I remember I'd only been in Falkirk a few months, I'm sitting in the cafe and I'm chatting to some guys and uh, over a frothy coffee or a frozen <laughs> Coke, listening to the Everly Brothers, as I say, or something. And... Uh, Oh, yeah, you, uh, so you live above the record shop. I said, yeah, and said, what about that bitch that manages it? Miss oh, but, oh, no. I said, oh, yeah, that bitch is my mum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean it. I said, don't worry, I think she's a bitch too, but I love her. Yeah. She's my bitch. See, and, uh, she was just, she wouldn't tolerate any nonsense. Guys, yeah. don't try and listen to records. Right. Me. Right. So, you, but you came down to London in the 60s, didn't yeah. you? Or, uh, I mean, is a whole, that, whole, is that leaping too far ahead? Go on, carry No, on. you're not really, because a whole bunch of things happens. I mean, it was not seen as a serious job, a boy, a man working in a record. Things were even more misogynist in those days. You know, girls, mm. girls worked in record shops, and it was just about like being the cash-out assistant at a supermarket. It was not too yeah. serious. Yeah. yeah. Um, Boys definitely wouldn't be a career. Um, and although I helped out in the shop from day one, I mean, even as a teenager, I was working in the record shop on Saturdays. So I knew already a lot about records. Um, but I tried to get proper jobs. I worked in the bank and I worked in a sawmill. and I, I did a whole lot of jobs to make money. A whole bunch of different jobs over a period of two years. And, uh, and then finally kind of ran away and did a trip of self-discovery, hitchhiking around Europe and things for about a year and a half. But you got a job at Disky, um, was it Disky Records? Yes, and then I came back to England in the mid-60s and um, ran away from Falkirk. Worked in Falkirk for a while for my mom's, in my mum's record shop and really got to know my stuff. But ran away, got fed up, um, as you do. I went to London, and I literally, it's London. Where do you go in London? Piccadilly Circus. I'm Scottish. That's what you do. 
got off the train, made my way to Piccadilly. This is straight off the train. <laughs> with your belongings in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a handkerchief off. on a stick. Yes. <laughs> Do you know what was Spotted what crazy? Anchors. Here in the middle of Piccadilly Circus, right on the edge, right almost on the corner, was a tiny wee record shop called Disky. And it had a thing in the window. Staff wanted, so oh, I really? just walked in. She... <clears throat> Unfortunately, the, the, the general manager, the, the small chain disc was there. And I said, I'm looking for a job. And he said, well, do you know anything about records? So I, I did a kind of basic interview and I said, I look, I'm, I was the buyer in my mum's record shop. Right. In and so he asked me a few questions. And I knew my stuff. And he went, great, we're looking for a buyer to run the Westbourne Grove shop. And I said, fantastic. Can I get a job? And I got the job. And I became the buyer. Westbourne Grove, 100 Westbourne Grove. It was on towards the Notting Hill Gate end. It was a really hip, quite a big shop, quite a big record shop with 20 booths where people can win in our food. 20 listening booths. That's a lot. That's big. Massive. That's huge. So yeah. can you remember when you said, so what year are we talking about that you started that? 1966. Six. So what were the big records you were selling? What were you saying, Revolver with that? Revolver, record? yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd already been running a beach bar earlier that year in Mallorca, and I got my mum had sent me a Revolver, which I blasted out. Revolver was the album. I think right. it's still my favourite Beatles album. I love right, it. Right, right. And uh, so, yeah, Revolver. Um, the first night, my, one of my best pals in Edinburgh was a guy called Mike, well, Mike Heron, you know who Mike Heron oh, is. Right, yeah. Yeah. And he just uh, joined Robin and Clive and they'd form, and I was at their first demo session for uh, the Incredible String Band. So they were about to come out for their first album. And, and that period was uh, Velvet Underground, did Velvet Underground just started? I think they had just... You probably have journey. You might have the first album. Jimi Hendrix album, probably. Right. Uh, well, the, I, I, I've got a great Jimi Hendrix story. Go on. <laughs> and it, right, running the beach bar, in a wee bit further back, earlier in the summer of 1966, I ran this beach bar for Angus McDougall, the guy from Falkirk. He bought a beach bar like Scottish business people did. <laughs> and, yeah. So I'm running the beach bar and hanging out the whole summer in my beach bar with the animals. Oh, what? And Zoo Money. And we became great pals. And Chaz Chandler was the slightly more serious one. The rest of us were getting stoned and wrecked all the time, you know, Eric Burden and such like. And, uh, but Chaz said, I'm off to America to do some business with uh, Jeffrey. And he came back, Mike Jeffries, came back a couple of weeks later. You know, you'll never guess. I've discovered this. This is un unbelievable. I've discovered this guy, black guy. Yeah. Been playing with little Richard, sidekicks, 19 years of age, good looking, sexy guy, you know, he plays the meanest guitar you've ever heard in your life, but he's also an incredible show and you can play with his teeth and everything else. And the crazy thing about him, although he's playing with little Richard, he's a big John Lennon, a Beatles fan, and Bob Dylan. These are his kind of heroes. So combined, the mixture is, just, and of course, I just thought that sounds like the dream musician. And of course, it was Jimi Hendrix. So skip forward a few months. I've now moved to London, working in Disky, getting married, uh, <laughs> and Chaz gets in touch and said, I mean, I hadn't seen him for about a month, but he knew I'd got married and we'd, kept, we'd vaguely kept in touch. I think I'd seen him at the Bag of Nails a couple of times, you know? And he said, look, Jimmy, who's now an immediate overnight sensation, uh, a star, is playing the Savile. Uh, oh, beginning. wonderful. Right. First of June. So that famous Savile gig, two tickets for you and, and Val, my first wife, um, uh, as a wedding present. Uh, uh, just go up and ask, you're on Jimmy's guest list. Oh, <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> so there we were watching. So that was early 1967. You know, I'd been in the shop a few months by this time. I was well established and Jimmy had become a superstar. And of course, everyone, the Stones, the Beatles were there, the Stones. Yeah. We were sitting next to Julie Christie and Terence Stamp. I mean, it was the beautiful people. So I was going to say, 66, 67, that's, yeah, that that's right really in the centre swing in London. You mu there must have been a real sense of things changing because, you know, the, 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 kind of, the so-called beautiful people were kind of few and far between, weren't they, really? They were, they were a tiny minority. Yeah, and of course, if you kind of identified with them, which I did, I mean, the people I felt, 
Mallorca in 1966 was the center of the universe. I mean, we were hiding American servicemen who were doing shore leave on their way to Vietnam in boats going through the Suez Canal and they would stop off at Bama. I mean, the, the animals, as I say, were probably the third biggest band in the world at the time. The beetles, the stones and the animals. Lady June, Cam June Campbell Kramer. June Campbell Kramer, I don't know if you know the name. Lady June, Linguistic Leprosy. She was made an album for Virgin Records. Mm -hmm. Great friend of Kevin Ayers. So I met David Allen and Kevin Ayers mm -hmm. at that time, who were very New York, uh, uh, Mallorca bound at that time. And um, so back in London, these kind of people, and I'm, we're friendly with Lady June, and her house was great. That's where Robert Wyatt fell off her balcony. Oh, oh yeah, of course. That's oh, Lady oh, June. Yeah. She was a pivotal kind of character. And um, so, yeah, so I knew that crowd. And I felt, that, I mean, I was, what, 1960, so I was 23 years of age. I yeah. felt like one of the beautiful people, you know. I'm totally, I love the Beatles, of course. And the right. Beatles were the center of everything. And London became, London seriously was unbelievably hip in those days. And it was at the time of Mary Quant and Bebop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the nightclubs were really bursting. And of course, the other thing about pop music is it had gone underground. There was this huge underground. And it's crazy, the Beatles, the biggest pop band in the world, also were like champions of the underground. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Lots of artists, you know. So, yeah. And the, the great thing about record shops then, and that's when... LPs came of age, really, and artists that you'd never heard of, never made the charts, but you'd sell vast quantities of their LPs. Leonard Cohen and Johnny Mitchell were coming out, Grateful Dead. Velvet. Well, also, it's amazing to me to reflect the incredible string band who you already mentioned. We're a top 10 act. Yeah, we're they were, huge. They were yeah. on the UK they were top 10 chart, alongside The Sound of Music and Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> They, there was the incredible yeah. Band. yeah, and played just, the Albert Hall. Oh, it's amazing. You know what's lovely, David, is you throw an angle about Humbert in there, because everyone goes on to me that, you know, youngsters today, or the 60s, it was just full of the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks. And I said, yeah, and, yeah, and Ken Dodd and Engelbert. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. I mean, we had all this mainstream stuff as well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so when you had a, a, a when you had a record, a huge record like Sergeant Pepper come out in oh. those days in June 1967. Yeah. Wait, how many would you sell in the shop? Well, like that? fabulous. It was fabulous. In my shop in Westbourne Grove, we sold a thousand in the first day of Sergeant Pepper. A thousand copies in the one shop. Um, Barry Class, who, who was the owner of Disky, and I went out in his Rolls Royce the night before. They were very strict about the day the records got released. And we went out the night before it was released to try and see if we could pick it up. So we guaranteed we'd have it on sale at nine o'clock in each of the Disky branches. But they wouldn't give us it. We went out to Hayes in Middlesex. In Hayes, right? Yeah. So we drove out. But they gave us a cover. A sleeve. Really? And, uh, so you turned up in a Rolls so Royce at the Hayes place. Yes. Like, Can I have my thousand copies of such a Very class no. was quite gauche. And uh, I mean, he discovered the foundations at that time. Baby. Right, right, right. Yeah. Ray rehearsed in the basement. I remember him playing with the demo. He said, Bruce, listen, there's this band rehearsed and driving me nuts. So I've been down to see them and I thought they were great. So I've signed them. And I, <laughs> he said, listen to this, what do you think? And he played with the song. I said, Sounds like second rate time than we're trying to me. Well, he did all right. <laughs> 10 million copies later. <laughs> so did you have people queuing for Sergeant Pepper? Or did they yes, just arrive? Yeah. Yes, we did. That's very exciting. I was smoking a lot of strange cigarettes in those yeah. days. And when All You Need Is Love came out, I remember putting it on. I had 20 copies of it lined up. And I got the staff ready. I said, right, put it on. And we put them in all the booths, so it was coming out in a yeah. ridiculous cacophony of noise. Oh, you need this. Yeah. I, mean, I had another guy that worked for me part time called Simon Stable. Oh, right. Yes, he used to write the music column wrote, in the International Times. That's exactly it. And <laughs> jump another year later when I opened the record shop at Falkirk with my brother, Simon wrote about us in International Times. Right, so you're, you're nationally exotic, known, yes. He wrote about all these exotic records. He did. And then he said, listen, if any of you north of the border in Scotland can't find, make access to these records, check out the Brian Finlay Record Emporium in Falkirk. 
right? Um, where you'll get them because we did imports, you know, and uh, and it, we got flooded with people from Edinburgh and Glasgow to our Falkirk shop, all because yeah. of Simon Staple. So at this Simon stage, Staple you must have been thinking about starting your own shop back in Scotland. Yes, I mean at that time. Um, so we're in London. It's fabulous, but we get pregnant. We're going to have a baby and we don't want it born in crazy London. It's crazy. We're nervous, frightened, we're young. Back to Scotland, back to mum. My mum takes us in, this is later in 1967 now, take us in where the, the baby is born in our, in the, well, not in the flat in the hospital, but we lived in the flat above the shop. Yeah. My mum, with her contacts, got me a job in a record department, Graham and Morton in Stirling. Um, uh, which was fantastic. I was, they needed a buyer, I was the buyer. So I'm yeah. talking back and forward from Falkirk. Now, Stirling, 1967 was the year they built and opened a new university. 10,000 mm-hmm. students, whatever, descended, all looking for the fugs, and Grateful Dead, and yeah, you know, yeah. looking for these exotic records, which I stopped in Graham and Morton. So the shop was a huge success. At the same time, my brother said to me, Bruce, uh, I want to open a record shop. I'm fed up working in McDougal's, doing hi-fi and television and things. We've fallen out. Would you help me open it? I mean, my brother knew about music. He loved music. That's the music I, I grew up with, his music. Yeah. And Elf itself. But I was the buyer. I, mean, I was very knowledgeable by this time. And I had these wonderful contacts in London with Alan Firth of Musicland had become a friend. And he supplied us with imports. So I helped my brother and we set up the shop and we opened at the tail end of 1967, the first record shop called it Brian Findlay's, Brian Findlay's record shop. And I still worked in the Sterling, you know, department store. But a few months later, Brian said, this is getting great. It was so busy, the shop it was doing so well. Um, come and join me, you know. And I did. And we were 50-50 partners. How did it come to be called? How did it come to be called Bruce's? Well, Brian Finley's in Falkirk, and we always angled to get back to Edinburgh. It was our hometown, and we wanted to expand. And of course, we had all these students. Thank you, Simon Stable, coming from Edinburgh and Glasgow to Falkirk to buy records. Stuart Cruikshank, who you may have heard of. Yeah, yeah. Stuart, yeah. yeah. Stuart, sadly, you see, Stuart was one of my and Brian Hogg. Two of them came through from Edinburgh. They were typical of the kind of people that came to our shop from out of town, from out of Falkirk. And he remained a lifelong friend. And Brian, Brian is still a lifelong, is still a great friend of mine and came and worked for me in the record shop in Edinburgh. But so we decided we'd like to open a second shop and we looked, Brian found it uh, um, in Rose Street. You know, we rented the space, it was next to our boutique. So roughly what year would this have been? 67. 67, uh, 69, right. sorry, sorry. 69, 69. right, yeah. I mean, we're yeah. looking throughout 1968 to um, to expand into Edinburgh. We finally found a shop at the tail end of 1968. It took us a couple of months to get it ready. So we opened at the beginning of 1969. And I said to Brian, can we call the second shop Bruce's? So we'll have Brian's and Falkirk and Bruce's in Edinburgh. I'll just oh, call it Bruce's. Mm-hmm. And I'd seen a record shop in a record shop bag from uh, America, from New York, a a record shop called The Colony. And they had the slogan, I found it at The Colony. So that's where I nicked the idea from. But that was a white carrier bag. The red crimson bag, which I got, that came from Mallorca. There was a a shop in Mallorca, a boutique called Mantrap. And it was this bright crimson bag, obviously a ladies boutique. And all I had on it was mantra, and I just thought that was so cool um, because I didn't know what it meant or what it was. Um, it didn't need to. So when I came up with the slogan, I found it at Bruce's record shop was in tiny print. Because I remember some art students coming into the shop saying, your bag's brilliant, but it's a crap design. I think, well, how can it be brilliant and a crap design? I know, but we could just say, come on, it's vulgar. And say, but you can you can hardly see a record shop. I said, that's part of the fun. It's a 12-inch bag. What else could it be? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see it. The good thing is people sitting on the top of buses would see that bag. Yeah. Absolutely. So this is a big mix left, of the bag became legend. So that was that was how the whole shop thing be- happened and began and developed and how it grew. But you were but, selling absolutely everything, weren't you? It folk and blues and sort of yes, what, what we now call world music, music, I suppose. Yeah. We used to say we specialised, well, we did imports. Yeah. So we specialised in imports 
And, um, and people say, you must have made a fortune off you. I said, no, we made a fortune of selling ABBA and the Beatles like everyone else, but we made our name from having these more exotic, yeah. wonderful yeah. records. And we did sell loads of them as it happens. I mean, we were the first people to import, for example, let's see, what well, I've got it here. I'm sure I do. Oh, that's another thing I want to put. Uh, <laughs> this, for example. Oh, Camembert oh, yeah. Electric. Camembert no, Electric. What a great record. <laughs> wonderful. Now, BYG Records, fans. All oh, right, yeah. yes, of course. Another big record, 69, was uh, in the Court of the, of the Crimson King. In the Court of the Crimson That no. one, that, one of the ones that just went through the roof. I love this one. ILPS, 9 treble 1. That's the catalogue. That, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a person who worked in a record pro. shop. <laughs> yeah. Island Records, the bottom of... I used to do a little single, single-inch column ad for sounds. Yeah. And we advertised in sounds. In fact, I think Simon Draper used to buy records from America, from South Africa, uh, from us, you know. They were, we, you know, we inspired Virgin Records shop. Um, but Island Records really were our speciality. We loved Island Records and we had a great relationship with them. We used to get our deliveries, Red Star Train from London from them. And the rep uh, came in and they used to have white labels of the next month's albums. So they had a white label of ILPS 9001 in the Court of the Crimson King debut album. And they played, I remember him coming in and he played it to us. And I said, it's fantastic. We will order 500 copies for Rose Street. And he said, what? I mean, yeah. they, when people were ordering one or none, yeah. who the I'm hell sure. was. And they, they showed you a picture of the cover. <laughs> you know that lovely cover. So I just knew it. You, you could tell when really a good instinct about what was going to sell and not. So we ordered 500 copies. Now, this is really good. We got it in on the Friday, and Friday afternoon, I was on the phone to them. Could you send me another 500 copies? You always sell 500 in a day. A day. That's astonishing, isn't it? They're just presumably they're just playing it. Because we're the one, probably the only. Yeah, but also planet. students, isn't it? You go about this thing about students. You know, you're yeah. in towns that had huge numbers of students, didn't you? Yes. And, and they would have a grant check at the beginning of grant, term. Yeah. Yeah. And and the records very often came out at the beginning of term, didn't they? People were clever. Record good record companies understood that. Good record shops like us. Grant shop, grant week, you know, when the kids got their grants, the students got their grants. Did they buy food? Did they buy clothes? No. Did they rent? Did they hell? They came to British record shop and spent a and fortune. starved for a month listening to. In the I mean, we, 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 <laughs> thank you, students, and thank you, student grants. Remember those wonderful days when students... Oh, yeah. Were, I mean, who would be a student today? It must be really, really hellish today. I mean, it was always oh, pretty tough. Yeah. Records became a very important part of student life. Right, yeah, right. Students were, were, were um, a major part of our custom. But it's also that point, you're going back to your, your record shop bag. Have you got it there? Show us that bag. Yeah. You were, I think you were showing us that earlier, yeah. just to remind people. Um, you know, I've, I've found it at Bruce's. This was so often, you know, a key part of the record uh, store uh, importance in those days was it was the only place you could find out about anything, wasn't it, really? Well, spot on, on, David. I mean, the best thing about record shops, um, well, the best thing was having the great, great stock and being able to buy your favourite artist at our shop. Um, but the other thing was it almost became like a little club. Mm, it was a yeah. little hub of information. People, We learned as much from our customers as yeah. they learned from us. And the other thing, too, is and it's something I meant to say, because you two in particular, coming from your background, how did you learn about records? Now, in the 50s and 60s, we had the Light Programme, BBC yeah. Light yeah. Programme, and yeah. we had Radio really Luxembourg, yeah. and we had American Forces Network. Now, in those days, we still had massive amount. When people say, you know, you hear stories about in Liverpool, uh, the reason rhythm and blues happened in Liverpool was sailors coming from America. The polls, like yeah. These stories sound mythical, but they're actually true. In Edinburgh, we had an American Air Force base at Kurt Newton nearby. An American serviceman would come in and hang out in you know, pubs and, and clubs, and they would bring records. And you would hear records you'd never heard of before, or artists. You certainly never got it from the British radio stations. No, no. no. And you, so we relied on Radio Luxembourg up to a point, 
American Forces Network record papers. Yeah, you know, around enemy and, and the NML maker. Yeah. yeah. When I employed people, I used to say, what record papers do you read? Now, unless they said I read them all, I didn't I didn't hire them. Right. They didn't get a yeah. job. I was very snobby about the people I employed. I had the best staff in the world. They tended to be a lot of them were students um, and took jobs with me either just to start their careers and going on to something else. Some of them stayed in the record business. Yeah. John Preston, he came and joined me and he went on to become chairman of the BMG, you know, and chairman of RCA Records and things. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so the record papers, and I, I read Enemy and Melody Maker in the, in the 50s, and then Enemy, Melody Maker, Record, Mirror and Sounds throughout the, the, the 60s and 70s. The 70s. They were really important, the record papers. And remember, these papers were selling quarter of a million copies. Yeah, they were. Yeah. They were huge. I mean, I think the NME had a circulation of 400,000 at one point. I mean, they really were influential and they influenced me. We read them avidly. And of course, our trade paper as well, uh, uh, which finally used to be called Record yeah. Taylor, it became Music Week. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, 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 sadly missed is the word, you know, boys and well. girls. <laughs> But people well, you've got no shortage of information nowadays. It's, it, it, it's kind of information comes to you about music nowadays. Whereas the point that strikes me about record shops is back in the day, you used to get most of your information just by going into a record shop all Absolutely. the time. You just looked, always looked in the new releases. Always, always, just in case there was something sure. new. That I yeah. <laughs> I, David, I used to have, uh, I mean, we, we filed our records alphabetically or maybe in genre. But I had one section, which was very fair, actually, because it was like, Bruce's nice sounds. Oh, nice, that's great. There uh, you go. Nice sounds. I what sort of like, things were in the nice section. sounds? And we, the, the thing is, I didn't... How, people would say, how can you like the incredible string band and Miles Davis? And I said, it's easy. <laughs> I just do. Yeah. You know? And I might like Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition as well or something. I mean, yeah. so in Bruce's Nice Sound, you'd get maybe a little classical, a little jazz, a little folk, a little rock and roll, you know yeah. what I mean? But we knew it was cool. It was just, and the other thing about the record shop in those days was, I mean, we'd watch on a quiet day, which was rare, maybe early in the morning on a Tuesday or something. Yeah. You know, it was fairly quiet. And a customer would come in and start browsing, and we'd nudge each other behind the counter, watch this. We'd put a record on. Yeah. And because we knew he was going to come up and say, What's that? What's this? What are you playing? You know, and so we'd test each other, see if you could judge the customer coming in, see if you can get it right. You just knew they would come up. It yeah. Such good fun. And, and you're quite right, David. People came into record shops and particularly on um, the weekends, you know, it was like they'd come into town and come into the record yeah. shop, and hang out. And well, I, I would literally, I literally, between the ages of about 14 and 30, I literally never walked past a record shop without going in. It's literally. Yeah, just go in, that. just in, just in case. You never yeah. know, you know. And because, you know, it was when things appeared in the record shops, you know, you, you knew they were real. You know, Absolutely. before that, they were just rumours. So with Bruce's, uh, you ended up in loads of, Scottish. We did. We expanded. Like, to be honest, the you had about movie. five. Was it five shops? No, in we the had end? thirteen at the end. Red. I mean, it's a big chain. In yeah, fact, yeah. It was the biggest independent chain outside London uh, <coughs> at one point. But the thing is, we had it to ourselves for about three or four years. Right. And then the mid seventies. I mean, Richard Branson started his record shop, so Virgin expanded. Yeah. Uh, into Scotland, I mean, opened in London, but long after us, you know. But yeah. um, I mean, I'll take, well, just sorry, let's jump back to mid 60s. Another shop of inspiration for me. It was band parts I mentioned in the 1950s, and my mum's, of course, record shop. Yeah. Then, coming to London, the, the, the role model for Bruce's record shop in, in uh, Rose Street was a shop called One Stop. In South Moulton Street. South Moulton Street. Oh, yeah, Danny Baker worked there. That yeah. was just such a fabulous shop. It was owned by Island yeah. Records, but it was so cool. And they specialised in and them. Also, in, I mean, London actually was full of great record shops. The other great chain, or small chain, called Musicland. Yeah, Alan yeah. Firth. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we became pals. And it was Alan Firth that supplied me with our first set of imports, lots of imports, for the first year of our existence. 
until we made real proper contacts ourselves with the American distributors. You know? Yeah. So in the mid seventies, when you start to get Virgin stores all over the country yeah. and H and V stores all over HMV the country, H and V expanded. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it gets it gets tough then well, quite still, quick. There, there, there was a cake, and the cake expanded a bit. And I just about had all of it. <laughs> Certainly right. in, in the sort of inverted commas, underground alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. You know, we had it to ourselves. But a bunch of other independents started up as well. Virgin was being one. But in Scotland, smaller independents, but really cool. Um, a shop called Listen in Glasgow. And they expanded yeah. another shop in Edinburgh, which I thought was very flat. And they called themselves the other record shop, uh-huh. <laughs> which was quite clever. So, and there was a shop called Phoenix. Uh, hell, I mean, we had Edinburgh, a small town, um, had, had such a lot of little independent stores by the mid to late seventies that we nearly went bankrupt. Yeah, and, uh, um, um, just we, we we had overexpanded. I mean, Rod Stewart opened our shop in Dundee. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> to the thousands of in, in nineteen seventy four. And he was the biggest selling artist in the world. It's like having Michael Jackson. I mean, it's crazy. I've just found a, a, a little advert for your Rose Street shop in 1974. It's an amazing snapshot of time. So, so <laughs> the new imports were New Riders of the Purple Sage, uh, uh, a home home on the on the on the road, <laughs> Blue Oyster Cult's Secret Treaties, Jefferson Airplane's Early Flight, Ian Matthews, uh, the new the new releases to order. Yeah, order now coming out soon. Rick Wakeman's Journey to the Centre of the Earth, <laughs> two pound wow. twenty-five, and Sparks Komodo My House, two pounds. Please wow. include cash. Postage is free. Oh, it's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? And, and also the amazing stuff that you're selling: cult, country, and old timey, fiddling Red Simpson, and the old Scratch Band. Lots what of folk, the, John Fay, the string band, Judy Collins, Charlie Parker, oh, such really. a variety of stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, you are Charlie Parker, Judy Collins. I mean, you couldn't get there so wide apart. I know. So, so were people, when you were doing mail order, how did that work? Were people sending well, postal orders or Yeah, cash postal or? orders, postal orders. Yeah. Uh, uh, checks. We had to wait till they cleared. Right, there you first. go. Yeah. Um, um, quite incredible. And yeah, we got lots of orders from abroad and from London. We even got people from, I mean, it was crazy. You get people from London yeah. ordering King Crimson or something. I mean, That's right, rather yeah, yeah. odd, that. <laughs> but, but the people enjoyed mail order, and I had a little mail order department and an export department. And the other thing, we were rekindled. Although we got nearly went bust, we got taken over by Guinness, the drinks company, oh. who had a retail division. And Brian and I retained, you know, 30% of the company. Yeah. Never quite the same. And I really became a bit disillusioned. But then that whole punk thing happened in the mid-70s, 76, 77. And I thought, I've got to start... Island Records had suggested I start a record label years before. And... Um, oh, was this Zoom? Uh, and they were going... Well, they were going to fund me. Yeah. I finally fund, did, did Zoom. But I found a band and, uh, and Island Records were going to fund me. And they said, you're always talking about people like the Humble Bums and... The average white, you know, what became the average yeah, white band. Yeah. We never take you seriously. And these artists go on to sell lots of records. So why don't you start your own label? And I said, I don't have the money. We'll fund you. So I found a band. You see this? Cafe Jack. Yeah, that's me. Yes, yeah. and, uh, wow. I remember seeing them. How was the audio when you were their manager? I was a manager, but I was also the waiter on the cover. <laughs> All right. That's me. Yes. Anyways, yeah, I found Cafe Jack and, and uh, Island Records said, we don't like them. <laughs> they sound like okay, an you ended up on CBS, wasn't it? Cafe yeah, Jack? I got them a record deal. I became their manager. And then Punk happened. And I thought, actually, you don't need millions of pounds to start a record label. I got yeah. to Jake Riviera. Uh, and I started Zoom. And uh, my first uh, single on Zoom, I've got it here, was well, uh, this. The Valves. Oh, yeah. right, cool. It's yeah. called... Yeah. For adults only, oh. I was walking down the Autostrasse all shagged out. I don't want to be just another damn crowd. Adolf was a piss artist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it sold 15,000 copies. Well, Huge. really? You had Slick. Didn't you have Slick as well? The second one was. Or Riz- Rizillo? I, I don't have it here. Um, slick changed their name briefly because Slick and the Basic Rollers were wiped out by punk. 
Yeah. And yet they were all still in their early 20s. They were kids. Yeah, yeah, sure. And Midge came to see me and he said, look, I've written this song called Gonna Put You in the Picture. And we've even come up with a spoof name, PVC2. Kenny, our drummers, come up with artwork and it was very punky. And I said, it's brilliant. Why don't you bring it out? And said, people think we're jumping on the bandwagon. I said, well, that's crazy. It's a great record. Well, yeah. Would you bring it out? And I said, yeah. So I brought it out. And it, again, it sold 12, 15,000 copies, went to number two in the indie chart. And Midge then joined the Rich Kids and the rest is history for him, you know. So, so yeah. Did, did you manage, did you involve with Simple Minds, weren't you? Were you not? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you managed them for years. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Do you see this? Cripes. Right. It started, I mean, it started as a, a bigger one. <laughs> That's Cripes number eight. Now, Cripes was... I found it at Bruce's. It was our newsletter. Right. We did charts. Yeah. <laughs> and we did editorial. Yeah, yeah. So, and so it was kind of based on a fanzine, you know, and, and, and sniffing glue and all that sort of stuff. We got it, it came, became a bit smaller. Right. Uh, um, and there, there's, there's the one. Look. Simple, do you see that? There you yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Yes, got yes. Simple Minds at Zoom, and I just signed them. Yeah, they were 1978. Right. I'm a beginner manager. Yeah, I managed them for the next 12 years. Oh, really? As long as that? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, listen, you guys came up and... Um, I came and did an old grey whistle test. I got to see them. We whistle test a few times. That's right. I mean, Mike Appleton was, I'd known Mike because Mike, I'd, I'd organized a pop festival in 1973 and uh, Mike Appleton came along and filmed it. And there was a famous night, a Trojan Records night. Alan Firth organized it for yeah. me. He curated, or Trojan Records curated it. He put me in touch, but it, it was my festival, the Edinburgh Pop Festival. And uh, Mike Appleton came along and filmed it. In fact, it still goes out. It's still quite an underground thing on YouTube. Right. Georgian night and uh, so Mike and I had become pals and Mike was really great he took Simple Minds in and in initially you know um, um, gave us a gig Ar Arista were no disrespect to him but they were useless there you go Putting, yeah no, you gonna, still remember you, you don't surprise me at all well my record shop the great thing about the record shop was the contacts I made through the shop the amount of artists I met I mean the first PA I had in the shop in Rose Street in 1969 was the Moody Blues, who were massive at the time. Yeah, sure. And then, in the, I mean, throughout the next decade, we had um, Blondie, the Police, the Ramones, uh, Tom Petty, uh, all in that wee Rose Street shop, all doing PAs. Billy Connolly, of course, because yeah. he came well. So we had amazing people. And I got to know so many people through the shop. So when I became a manager, my contacts were better than the record company's contact. John yeah. Peel, I used to, you know, he used to get a copy of Cripes every week and he championed the label and he, he played the valves and he played played early Simple Minds as well, you know. But I suppose yeah. also if you're if you're involved with a big retailer, particularly a big regional retailer, it's a little bit like Brian Epstein, isn't it? When Because EMI couldn't afford to, to tell him to go away, could they really? Because he was the guy... <laughs> Bought a lot of their product in the oh, Northwest. Yeah. And I, I, people often say to me, "Who's who's your role model?" And I would say, "Definitely Brian Epstein." You know, he was from the regions. So I started yeah. the great thing about it's one of the reasons I love Tony Wilson. It's I mean, Tony Wilson's big thing is we're not London. Yeah, yeah. London did become an. I mean, I've got great stories about this. You know, when the Beatles' White Album came out uh, in 1968, Brian and I were up and running, of course, at the shop. Now, it was a double album, a million copies, advance orders of that. And EMI reckoned they couldn't distribute it all in the one day. So they staggered it. And they let us know they were staggering it. And we were going to get ours a week after London. Oh. I thought, screw that. Okay. <laughs> on the phone to my friend Alan Firth in London, Musicland, when are you getting yours? Or we're getting them on the Thursday night, whatever night it was. We're picking them up. <coughs> so we have them first thing in the morning. I said... If I came to London in my car, could you get an extra 500 copies? He said, no problem. Fantastic. And so I went to London, picked them up, drove overnight back to Edinburgh, got them on sale, or to Falkirk, who didn't even have the Edinburgh shop at the time, and put them on sale. And went, you know, uh, Brian Finlay's first in Scotland with, and EMI were livid. 
Oh, very well. And, uh, and, she come, and she said, what are you going to do about it? I said, how dare you? Who do you think you are? Yeah. You know, I've got, believe it or not, Scottish people do travel. If I've got a friend of mine that comes into my record shop on a Saturday, having, you know, having been in London the day before, I said, look what I've got, Bruce, I've got the Beatles. You don't have it, but they've got it in London. I it's can't lovely, do that. Lovely idea, record labels complaining about people buying their music these days. Exactly, so <laughs> it was brilliant. So we really yeah. upset them. But I mean, I was, I'm, I'm not a Scottish nationalist, but I'm fiercely proud of being a regional guy. You know, I come from where I come from. And I remember saying to EMI, I don't believe you couldn't distribute it. Do you know the Sunday Times? <laughs> yeah, they managed yeah. to do it. And yeah. them, remember, they'd only just recently started their magazines. And yeah, all that. yeah. And so you buy that in John O'Groats and Land's End on Sunday. It might be in the afternoon, but on Sunday. You know, so if they can do it, you can do it. Yeah. And we changed the rules. I mean, we, we Scotland got better service. There. So much so that Decca, a few months later, knowing this story, we're going to do the same bloody thing with that new Moody Blues album. I can't remember which one it was. To our children's children's children. Yeah, it family. would be. Yeah. And they, but they were being smart. We'll give it to Scotland first. Oh, really? And they told me, Alan Firth, my friend Alan, um, was opening a new Music Land store. So I did the opposite. I got them for him. Right. To London. So he opened his new store in London, but the only shop in London with the Moody Blues. Yeah. Decker was yeah, they- why did you do that? And I said, because. There should be a leveling up. Us, us music lovers don't want to be treated like no, no you know, fodder. So, so it, it, there were glory days when there were loads of record shops in Edinburgh. How yeah. many are there now? Would you say not very many? But <clears throat> I mean, all the big stores, the, the Towers and the Virgins and the HMVs have gone. Although HMV are reopening, yeah, really, currently in Prince Street. They also bought over a small chain in Scotland about 10, 15 years ago, called FOP. And oh, yeah, so we know FOP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. FOP are really good. A nice little shop. Yeah, FOP. yeah. Four but we pounds. Do have, for it, yeah. We do have indie shops in Edinburgh, which um, one or two have survived and one or two have opened. And because of the resurgence and in interest in vinyl. Vinyl, yeah. So, and what's great about these shops is they're very like British record shops in the 60s or 70s, early 70s. They're small and they're intimate, and they're knowledgeable, and they're friendly, and uh, they're not a department store. So it's a really interesting point, this, about, about the size of these places. You said yeah. it was all modelled on one stop. And one stop was so tiny, you could only get out of three customers in the place. Exactly. And Disky and Piccadilly Circus must be, which I only Even saw smaller. the other day, must have been yeah. similarly small. It was really small, yeah. And um, whereas <laughs> as, soon, as soon as you get mega stores, I found... There was something just about the, the, there was kind of too much choice. You were just overfaced by it. But also you don't get that personal thing. You You don't get the idea. The people behind the counter had no time to talk to you. Absolutely. That's the key thing. Also, the people behind the counter (laughs) didn't necessarily know a huge amount about records either. Excuse me. Sorry. That's all right. Same. But when you sold, when you sold up, I think it was in the early eighties, wasn't it? So why did you do that? Record shops were still obviously thriving then. So why did you you (coughs) decide to sell in the end? They were. Now, I had become disillusioned. The Guinness retail people got in touch with me because I'm now concentrating on Zoom yeah. and Simple Minds, not on the shops. And they yeah. were furious. Your name's above the door, Bruce. We don't think your band are going to make it. Right. Simple Minds. I said, look, I think Guinness is possibly the worst beer in the world. <laughs> what do I know about beer? Yeah. And I know about as much about beer as you know about rock and roll. I mean, please, back me. You know, I said, look, Zoom could become huge. Zoom could become a standalone record company. Yeah. It's virgin if you backed me. You know, everyone comes to me in Scotland, you know, and I'm very lucky. We're popular, we're well-liked, we're respected, and young artists coming through, we, we could be their go-to record label, you know? So, but I need support. I need financial support to get it. Oh, no, no, we don't agree. And yeah. um, so, uh, uh, so I said, okay, give me a year's salary. I'll give you my 50% in Bruce's and, uh, and let me take away the Zoom stroke Simple Minds management and, uh, and I'll stand alone. And that's what happened. So I split 1980 from the Bruce's thing 
Right. And concentrated entirely on managing simple amounts. I gave up Zoom as well. As right. I mentioned, but I didn't look for new artists. Although I took on other management roles. I ch managed China Crisis for 10 years. And I managed a band called The Silencers, another band for about 10, 12 years, throughout the 80s into the early 90s. Bruce, it's been absolutely fascinating. I've got a feeling we're going to have to come back to you and talk about what you know about managing hats. <laughs> yeah. I think that, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's been honestly. I've yeah, you know, I know quite a fair bit about record shops, but I've learned an awful lot in the course of that, and I'm sure lots of other people have. But you don't keep many records yourself, do no, you? No, I mean, I, I do keep. I do keep some. I mean, I've got got things like this, you know. Well, look, yeah. look at that. Right. Can you read that at the top there? Oh, that is a bag from Bruce's. It, it says oh, Bruce's look, look. records. Bruce's records. Yeah, yeah. About, um, things. Now, that, and one of the reasons I wanted to show you, this is just boast, this is just showing off. But just before we go, well, there it is. In 1969, just when we opened the record shop, there was this tour. We called it Changing. This is so right. from it. Wow. I still got it. Wow. Oh my goodness! See? Humble pie, lift it up a bit higher. Hold it up, hold it humble up. Pie, humble pie, love sculpture, and David Bowie, and who's that? What did you say? Griffin. 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 <laughs> oh my God! Right. Whatever happened look, to them? Look yeah. at look at David Bowie there. Oh what? So this was a tour. Was it a tour or were a, you involved in that tour? They played, they played the Usher Hall. And David that? Bowie was there in denim with his big curly hair, like Bob Dylan. Yeah. And control to my jet home. There you go. That's <laughs> very good. We got supporting him. Humble Pie. Supported by Griffin. That's fantastic. Yeah. Humble Pie. So, it's not, this it's is not Griffin, this is, is it? It's not Griffon, who were a group no? on Transatlantic. It's no, Griffin. Griffon were the wise. Oh. Griffin. Yeah. Griffin, yeah. Never heard of them. I never heard of them again, anyway. Humble oh. Pie were fantastic. Actually. Oh, yeah, we used to we're love enormous Humble Pie. Admirers of those. Big yeah, fan. They were, they were yeah. great. Well, one of the other things about record companies, remember that one? Oh, certainly yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How important these records were. That's like Hugely 12, important. 12 Huge. and 6 months for all these artists. Moby yeah, Cray. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Nice Enough to Eat was the one for me. Nice absolutely Enough to Eat. The other one, I yeah. discovered Nick Drake and various people. It was yeah. very clever. Mareki companies did have some interesting people working for them. I mean, I uh, I never saw one of my things about managing a band. Uh, bands, the Malcolm McLaren school of thinking was record companies are your enemy. Just take money off them. You know, take the money and run. I was the opposite. I said record companies should be your lovers. Yeah. You know, don't f u c k them. You know, make yeah, them. Yeah. them. Yeah, uh, um, they will help fund you and such. So now, there's no doubt about it. Record companies made far too much money. Uh, out of the artists and um, and out of the public at the end of the day. I think records could have been cheaper. Yeah. Um, artists could have been paid a bit more and record company executives didn't have to become multimillionaires. You yeah. Know? So things did change, but I loved record companies. I loved uh, the way they worked. I loved when I first became a manager going around the record company and uh, just seeing how they operated and seeing the enthusiasm. I mean, some record companies more than others. Some record companies, the people that worked in them was just a job. Other record companies, they were like you guys. They were totally, utterly passionate, nutcases. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. And they were so, and they loved their artists. The record companies that loved their Island Records were my absolute yeah. all-time favorite label. Yeah. And then uh, my relationship with Simon Draper at Virgin Records, he was fantastic. And uh, without Simon, um, I don't think Simple Minds would have made it as big as they did, but he was a terrific and yeah. the team behind him at Virgin Records. They were, they were, mm. they were great days. Mm. Well, it's so lovely that that people still remember that, and it's still people posting all the time about Bruce's records and about how uh, influential it was and uh, how it meant so much to people. There's the beauty of having your name above the door. Yeah. You see, if, it is, yeah. if this had just been kind of I don't know what whatever the record shops were called, kaleidoscope records That's or right. whatever, yeah. Yeah. nobody would remember it the same way. Yeah, <laughs> you know, no. you're, you're, listen, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're immortalized. They're, they're, they're a bit anonymous, disky, one-stop music. Yeah. They're a bit anonymous. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. There were other record shops that they Gloria's record store and things that. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's a vanity thing in a way, but I just wanted it to be like Joe's Cafe. Yeah, no. This is record shop. And I, I thought, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, and the record shop. 
Absolutely. Well, that was an important thing at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, Personal yeah. recommendation, you know. Bring back the high street full of little shops, including little record shops and a yeah. little coffee bar next door with a jukebox. Yeah. Happening. There you go. Bruce. Thanks Bruce. so much, Bruce. It's Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.